Pues ahora os voy a presentar a Alain Elaili. Alain Elaili es Principal Solutions Engineer en GitHub desde 2015. Lleva, por tanto, eh, en esos 15 años en la industria del software, siendo un activo promotor de, del open source y ayuda a muchas organizaciones a construir mejor y más rápido sus aplicaciones, reforzando las relaciones entre los equipos de desarrollo y los equipos de operación producción. Su ponencia, que va a ser en inglés, se denomina A Little Less Conversation, A Little Bit More Action, y tratará de cómo los desarrolladores todavía necesitan de prácticas modernas y estar más equipados aún para poder automatizar tareas y conseguir así eh, un mejor time to market. Pues Alain, bienvenue. Merci. Hola. This is a torture, that microphone stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Apologies for speaking English. My, uh, my Spanish has not improved since last time I came here. Uh, it was like two years ago, right? The previous edition. One year and a half. All right. Who was there one year and a half ago? A couple of people. All right. So I was, I was already on the scene one year, uh, one year ago and uh, one year and a half ago. And I, at that time, I presented how uh, GitHub deploys GitHub. Um, Uh, on, in production environment, we do that about 80 times a day. That was at that time. Uh, there was 80 uh, deployment of GitHub.com every day in production. Um, we have changed things, and uh, well, basically, my talk today is not about GitHub. Uh, and you know, it's not about how we're going to uh, how we're working internally at GitHub, but. It's more about the vision of the developer um, nowadays uh, here in Europe and uh, how we're trying to change the way we are working on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, so I would like to start, to start with um, uh, a reflection about this book. Has anybody read that book? It's like four years old. Yeah, no, yeah, something like six years old now. Uh, it's been written by the guy who is the CEO of New Relic, you know, that startup in, uh, in the Silicon Valley. And uh, the name is the, the New Kingmakers, How Developers Conquer the World. So when I saw that book, I was like, yeah, interesting. I want to be, uh, be a king, right? Uh, I, I feel like I deserve to be a king. And, and After reading that book, I realized that I got the title totally wrong. You know, it's not about how to become a king. It's about we are king makers, but we are not the kings. Far from that. And um, developers probably are king makers in San Francisco, but I don't feel we're there yet in Europe, right? I mean, I don't feel like developers are at that level in, in companies where we feel that we are empowered and uh, we can rule everything. I mean, we're talking a lot about um, digital transformation, and developers should have a big role in that digital transformation, but not everywhere yet. So how do we, how do we work our way in order to, to be more uh, preeminent in companies, and how do we show that we can deliver value and, and be more important? So first of all, if you are old enough, Uh, and you remember what was the landscape 10 years ago when we started a project. So whenever a project needed to be started, we had to find budget for servers. You know, we, we had to add servers at that time. Uh, they were physically racked somewhere. Uh, we needed to find budget for licenses. I mean, Linux was already there, but not everybody was using Linux in production environments, so we still had Solaris, AX, you know, Windows, still a thing. Um, we needed uh, licenses for our database, for our Java application server, for all these things, you know, and we needed these licenses for the production environment, for the pre-production environment, for the QA environment, for the test environment, for the development environment. We needed so many things and so much budget before we even started to write a single line of code, right? So in, in, in the IT environment, budget was owned by production. You know, they were the one uh, running everything, running the show. They had the big budget because they were the big spenders. They were the ones who were in charge of that, and the developers didn't have that much. And most of the budget of our projects was coming from all these things we needed to buy before it. And 
you needed to know exactly you know, which kind of environment you would need, and you had no clue whether that, pro that, that project would be a success or not. So you were trying to make some investments based on ideas that this might work, but we're not too sure, but let's invest 200,000 euros to discover if it can work. Right, that was the, uh, the bottom line. So nowadays, and I mean, uh, we've seen you know, all these technologies uh, on the screen. Nowadays, we can start with zero. Right? We can start with no investment. We can start with open source technologies. We can start with cloud. We can start with systems where you pay as you go. And so all the investments we need now is on the development side. The only investment companies need to have, basically, is the developers. So now what we see is that the budget and the power is shifting from productions to developers, to development. And that's a good move. I think that's a really good move. Um, we, and we, we are, as developers, we, we are in capacity to bring innovations to our companies, right? Racking servers doesn't bring any innovation to any company, but developing new software, uh, developing things that are supporting the business are going to uh, bring some great value to our companies. So that's what we want to do. But what's the current, what's the current situation? Right? We all want to be uh, the ones that are going to bring miracle and uh, like, uh, you know, groundbreaking projects, new technologies, new product to our companies. And so we have started working, uh, you know, DevOps is here, we're using it, we are building these factories, right? These software factories, we're trying to deliver. We are, we are using all this vocabulary from the industry in order to show that we can automate things and we go can go fast and can be repeatable, and uh, we can work on reducing the defects and everything. Um, well, I mean, that's what we want to think we can do, right? Um, so, but we, we're trying to do that. Um, and if we are doing that, if, if this is our landscape, if, it's, this is, if this is our vocabulary, then does it mean we are that guy? I mean, think about it. Are you that guy? I'm a developer working on a software factory. Um, we get a delivery pipeline. We're doing Kanban. You know, all these things coming from the auto industry vocabulary. So are we that guy, right? I mean, think about it for a second. Um, are you like all dirty and greasy? Um, but are you like working on an assembly line? But this guy also is not only working on an assembly line, he's also the guy who is working next to the robots and everything. So when you first see that picture, I mean, when I first saw that picture, I was like, no, I'm not that guy. You know, I'm like much bigger and uh, much smarter and everything. I don't get dirty. But, you know, then you think a little bit more about that. And you're like, yeah, I can get dirty sometimes. You know, it can, it can go in the, into, into the code and everything. So I might be that guy. And so there was this, um, this guy in France, he had a very interesting talk about what is a software engineer, basically. And he made an analogy with all the other engineering um, roles that we have in other industries, like civil engineering or um, you know, mechanical engineering, all these, all these guys. And he said, like, it's interesting because an engineer doesn't build anything, right? You don't see an engineer building a bridge. He, Builds, he writes the, the maps, he writes the, the, the blueprints, so somebody else can build a bridge, right? He's not, not you know, using cement and everything to build a bridge himself. So, are we the only engineers actually building things? Or maybe the, and, and he went further and he was like, actually not. We are still the people writing the plans and writing the blueprints except that our blueprints is code. Because who, uh, who is actually building the code? Well, it's a compiler, it's a machine. You know, it's, uh, that's where the code is being built, and that's where the code is running. We're not running the code ourselves. You know? So somebody else is building that for us. But the specification, at the end of the day, is the code itself. And that's the only detailed enough specification that really matters, right? So. Thinking about that, you're thinking about, yeah, that's true, right? Like, whenever somebody's writing a specification in Microsoft Word, 
you know it's shit. You know, you know it's not going to work. You know, it's, you know when you're going to implement that, a lot of things are going to happen, and that piece of paper can be thrown in the garbage because it's it's wrong. Basically, there's so many missing parts. So, the only specification that matters is actually the code. So, let's think about you know, let's think about that. So, what is all the other things we're doing? Uh, that could be like thrown away if we start thinking that way. Like all, all the other documents, all the other tickets, all the other things that we spend a lot of time working with, when at the end of the day we know that they don't really matter. So we could start rethinking a little bit our way of working. The other thing that I find very interesting is how we work um, as a team, you know. Um, and that's, I think that's very different from the other, other engineering um, uh, functions. The uh, developer, um, the developer, or the the software engineer, if you want to call him that way, or her that way, um, has to both use logic and creativity. And uh, you could say it's true probably for every every engineering team. Um, and it's good to remind people that you know we are using logic and creativity both sides of the brain. Because very often, you know, we've, we're working with this ticketing system where people like push a ticket and they think that we're going to grab that and work happily that ticket and deliver some value and then hop onto the next ticket and hop onto the next ticket. And we're going to be able to measure that thing and it's going to be automated and like fast and repeatable and everything. Without thinking that at the end of the day or so, um, we're using technology, but you need to also use psychology in, in development. We are part of a team, and there is up and downs. Um, there is like human interactions. That's super important. I mean, we keep talking about agile and human interactions, but with all these ticketing systems, we kind of lose a track. We kind of lose track of this of this human interaction, and all these measurements we apply to ourselves, like. Measuring velocity, like does anybody do story points and measure velocity and like say, hey, we delivered 20 points this week and this next week we're going to try to deliver 21 points. I mean, we are humans working on complex systems and the thing is we never, hardly ever reproduce the same architecture and the same software. We always have a new component, a new thing, something that we've never thought about a new business problem to respond to, a new technology that we need to in, uh, involve. So our business is absolutely not repeatable. Right? We never were doing the same software twice. Like Nobody writes twice the same software. We always write something different, and yet we are applying all these kind of tools and techniques that are making people think that we can actually measure, uh, predict, predict the times we're going to spend, how can you predict something? I mean, how can you say, hey, I'm going to do that in two weeks? You're dead sure it would never take two weeks. Like, it never ever takes two weeks whenever you say two weeks because you never solved that problem before. So how can you estimate the time it's going to take? So that's all these things we're trying, I mean, I'm trying to get rid of. And uh, um, so as an industry, we've applied some techniques. I'm sorry. The there are some missing bits over there. I had to convert to Microsoft uh, PowerPoint from Keynote, and interesting things happen when you do that. Um, OK, so um, it says from agile with a lowercase a to agile with an uppercase a. So we've seen that, that in the past probably six, seven years, like people moving to agile, to agile with an uppercase a, so applying a methodology. and which is the total opposite of being agile with a lowercase a, meaning I'm adapting to my world, I'm creating my own solutions, and I revisit my solutions every so often because my world is changing every so often, and I need to constantly adapt. So I'm not taking an off-the-shelf uh, methodology and applying that. I'm being really, really agile and adapting to, uh, to my environment. Um, likewise, I mean, that's, that was the landscape for the past uh, five to six years. So all the big companies saying, you know, we are agile now with an uppercase A. Um, 
By the way, this book, People Wear, is really good. There is one sentence in that says, like, you, um, you pay your people to go to work every day. It would not cost you any more dollar if they were putting their brain to work when they're coming to work. Right? So you get bodies that works. It doesn't cost more money to have them using their brain. And I think that's really good. Um, so that was the agile thing. So everybody has been doing agile. I don't know a single company who's saying like, oh, we're not agile. They say they are. They, they've done the stuff, they've hired the coaches, they've, been, they've done the stuff, but whatever, does it work? Not really. So now what they're trying to do is say, okay, we want to be agile at scale. So there's a methodology for that. They can do safe, they can do all the stuff. But very often now, they are saying like, oh, we're doing the Spotify model. So who is doing the Spotify model? Like who has tribes and uh, uh, you know, all these uh, things they have? So there, there was a video in January 2014 about the, the Spotify with the Spotify team talking about their engineering culture. They didn't uh, say anything about their engineering method, right? Or their engineering model. They were talking about their engineering culture, right? Culture, super important, culture. It's not a method. A culture is not a method. Culture is not something that you can copy and paste, right? But they were talking about that. And so um, people took the easy beats of that. You know, we got squads, we got tribes, the squad leader, and blah, 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 and up. Oh, we are playing that. We are as agile as uh, Spotify now but we don't have the culture, right? Part of the uh, element of the culture, I mean, one of the examples they, they, they quote uh, in the blog post, they have a blog post after, uh, with that, and where I took that disclaimer. That, so that's a disclaimer from Spotify. By the time you read this, and sorry, it's, uh, there is a sentence behind that. By the time you read this, things have already changed. So whatever you're trying to copy from them, they're not doing it anymore. They're not doing it anymore, but you are applying that, thinking that is, uh, that's the recipe of success. But they have already iterated on that. They have already said, hey, that was good, but now we have better. Better because our world has changed, and that their own unique world. And that's very interesting because it happened exactly the same way in the auto industry 30 years ago. Right? Toyota was innovating, was bringing some new stuff, and there was this, you know, um, so zero defect systems and everything. And they even, you know, they in invited other uh, um, car manufacturers to see their plans, to see their way of doing things, to see their process. They were like, yeah, we're competitors, but you can see whatever you want. You can copy whatever you want. Because they knew that the one thing they could not copy and the one thing that mattered the most was the culture, not the process, but the culture. So it was all about creating a culture that makes sure that um, you know, everything you put around works flawlessly, uh, there's a sense of trust, there's this autonomy, uh, people are trusted to do their work, and people are trusted to improve their way of doing their work. You know? There is not somebody who's going to say, you have to screw that stuff differently. No, the guy who is screwing things on a day-to-day -day basis is empowered to say, no, I don't think that's the best way to do things. I'm going to do that differently, right? So that's, that's uh, really, really cool to uh, think about it that way and say, you know, doesn't matter how they're doing things. We need to look at how we can change based on our current culture and how can we bring uh, new elements of things. And it needs to go, it needs to come all the way from the top, right? I mean, you can, you can do everything you want, but if your boss at the higher level is not convinced that culture matters, then you won't go anywhere. And I, I love these pictures. So this is, this is guys from Société Générale, so it's like the third bank in France. And see that guy, he has a t-shirt, my CEO has a GitHub account. And so that's the CEO of Société Générale. And they are meeting with that guy once a month for an hour to teach him how to code in Python, right? Everybody keeps saying, like, you know, digital transformation, that I scientist. The guy was like, okay, I want to understand. You know, show me. Show me how it works. What can I do with that? So he's learning how to code. And that was 
such great a signal internally at Societe Generale that developers does ma do matter. They do matter because even our CEO wants to be a developer. I mean, that's when you start changing the culture. So, it's super important. And it's going to become even more important moving forward. So there was that study from Stripe, um, Stripe, you know, the payment company in the US, uh, online payment. They created a story called the developer coefficient. That story, that um, study, sorry, is, is about, you know, what the impact of a developer in a business or in a global economy and how, how, how much of a de uh, developers can, uh, can create value to, to their companies. And what they found over there is that right now, high-quality software engineers are the most precious resource that you can have. So it's easier to find capital. It's easier to raise money. And you know, you, you, if you listen to the news, you, you, you hear about the startups raising 20 million, 30 million, 200 million, whatnot. It's easier to raise money today than to find very talented developers. All right. Um, so everybody is saying like, hey, you know, we have a supply problem. We need to, you know, we need more developers. We need to find more people and everything. So yeah, that's true. That's true. But then you cannot say that without looking at what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, how much time are we wasting? Like the current developers we have. Let's not talk about the one we don't have because that's a totally different problem, and we might not be able to to solve that problem soon. But let's try to work on the problems we already have and that we can solve. How much time are you wasting in day-to-day -day base? Like, try to figure how much time you are not developing on a day-to-day -day base. As a developer, you've been paid, I mean, you've been hired, and somebody think that you spend your time, 100% of your time, developing and creating code. Well, we know that it would never be the case, right? You cannot, it would be stupid to be developing 100% of time, because you need to interact with other people, we need to uh, learn, we need to do all kinds of things, so 100% time coding is, is like, would be stupid. But here, if we look at that study, we see that we're spending 42% of our time working on things that are not creating direct value to our projects. So solving bugs, working on technical depth, stuff like this. So not creating new features, right? And we want to think that we're creating new features. We don't want to think that we spend our time debugging code. That, that would not be very interesting. Um, so that's a huge amount of time, right? 42%. And I'm suspecting that, you know, within the other 58%, there is a good amount of time being in meetings that are probably not all useful or spending time, um, you know, dealing with tickets and stuff like this. So if you think about how much you cost your company and you, you know, do the math and everything, you, you see at the end of the day, if you look at your whole team, that's a lot of money, right? That's a lot of money, and, and that's a lot of missed opportunities in terms of you know, creating more things, right? So the, um, the outcome of that study is to say, you know, um, it's not about getting more developers, but it's about better leveraging the current resources we have. So making sure that our developers are working in a much more, in a more efficient way and go faster and, you know, and, and deliver uh, more software. So how do we empower that? So obviously, DevOps, you know, we know that with DevOps, we can, uh, we can accelerate things. So, and and um, there's been that, that's another study by Dora, you know, the, the people who created um, the book, um, the Phoenix Project, they are now part of uh, Google. So they will tell you that, um, you know, efficient companies, people, uh, companies that have really embraced DevOps, uh, see their developers spending a lot more time doing new work than uh, doing, you know, working on defects and working on that. So it's, if you've read the Phoenix Project, it's all in that book already. Um, another uh, table, so that's another uh, DevOps report and very close to, the, to what you saw uh, earlier. Uh, it's a different study, but same results, that's good. I was worried we would come with different results on that, so <laughs> relieved. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I love that because for many people, uh, people who are not in our business, it's kind of, in, uh, kind of intuitive. It says that basically the more often you deploy, the less production problem you have. You know? 
And, and for many years in our industry, we've, we've added more and more blockers, more and more gates for productions because we thought it would be safer that way. So another QA cycle, another test, another thing, another that. Uh, a sign off, you know, if you do ITIL, another sign off by some manager that has no idea of what we're doing. Um, and we thought that would be making things safer, and, and we saw that it doesn't make anything safer. But going faster production is making things safer. So that's all these things, basically, are what we are factoring in at GitHub. Um, the role of the developer, the importance of the developer, automation, um, how can we go faster? How can we leverage all the tools we have and You've seen all these tools, right? You show so many tools, and they're all useful. And you need to navigate that, that landscape of tools to um, make sure that you, you, you are productive. And, and our problem in our industry is that, again, we always use new things. We keep using new things um, for good reasons, sometimes less good reasons, but that's the case. We are using good new things every time. So how do I grab all these things and make sure that on a day-to-day -day base, these tools makes me more productive and go faster uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to, my, um, to my goal, to my goal which is delivering business, delivering value, sorry, to my business. So for that, we decided to create um, something at GitHub called GitHub Actions. So who, uh, I mean, it's, a, a it's, it's still a beta program right now, but who has access to that? Because many people already can have access to that. So who is registered to the beta program at GitHub Actions? Nobody? Come on. We get, oh, at least one. We get hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people who are in that program, and I, I don't think we have filtered out the whole country of Spain. So I'm quite surprised. So what? I, you know, yeah, it, it's, it's good anyway, because I, I'll be able to show you some cool stuff. So, so GitHub Actions is it's coming from that, that recognition that our landscape is, is becoming very complicated, and we need to orchestrate so many things now. But we don't want to spend our time building toolings. We want to build software. We want to build uh, value. So um, how can we go faster at you know, delivering things and making sure that the developer can focus on what matters, which is the code itself. So I'm going to show you a little demo of that, um, if, you, if you want. You all want me to show you a demo of that, right? And I need to get rid of that stuff here. No, there you go. All right. So what does it look like? Oh, it's not the right screen. Love that. All right. I need to do some magic here. Let me do that. Uh, displays. All right, that would be much better if you can see what I see. There you go. All right. We're good. OK. So let me show you uh, what you can do. Oh, I think this is mine. So for, for who's who um, have access to, to GitHub Actions, you see we, we have a new, um, a, new, a new tab over there uh, to access the actions. But I want to put that into a context and not just throw, uh, throw that feature at you, but show you, you know, uh, really how it, how it can work in a day-to-day -day, uh, workflow, basically, for a given developer. So we like to start uh, with issues, usually. So I got a new idea. I'm going to present. I'm going to ask somebody to do something for me. Um, so you start with an issue. And one of the, um, the, 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 the great thing at GitHub is that we're working with all the maintainers of the open source software in the world. So they, they have unique millions problems, like problems that usually you don't, you don't have, have to deal with because, because they, they have to deal with me. But it creates some interesting needs in terms of how do I scale? How do I make sure I automate a Mac, you know, so many things so I don't 
get burned just by sorting incoming issues and everything. So we created things for them, um, like you know, issue templates. For instance, if somebody wants a new feature, you just need you just have a feature request template, and it comes already pre-filled with some fields, uh, some some information you want. It gets an ISINE. You can attach an ISINE directly to a template. You can attach some labels to a template. So it makes the sorting of things a lot, a lot faster, right? Um, but it still, it still remains a conversation. So that's very important for us. Still putting the, humans, the human being in the center. Um, we don't want to be filling tickets. So that's why nothing. There's no ticket word in, in GitHub. Uh, it's all about conversations. We want to remain. People who are talking to other people and not, you know, people who are processing, um, you know, batches sent by other people. So that that whole vocabulary, I think, changing the interactions between humans very drastically. So let's say um, we need a new um, welcome message, and that's that's one of the thing I prefer, I don't know if you see that, but now it's looking into the old issues and, and finding some that could be related, so we, we avoid creating some, so we get some noise. Uh, we need a new welcome, oh, sorry, message. All right, and I'm not going to change anything, we don't care about that, so I'm going to submit that, and now um, we can uh, add that to a project. So. Project or so is it's super cool stuff. Um, you probably, I mean, I hope you've seen that you can have projects now. So there are Kanban boards basically with colons. So I've done, I've worked a little bit already. So I've got a couple of stuff in the done column over there. So now you can have private repos for free on GitHub, and you can have your own personal projects as well uh, within GitHub. So I, I personally use that as a bookmark. Uh, as, a, as like a personal organization board. So I have my own board for my own life. Um, that looks sick, right? I got a board for my own life. But whatever. Uh, and I use that to organize everything I, I need to do. So I have a to-do uh, colon, I got a business colon, I got a personal colon, I got all that kind of things. And you can drag and drop your, your task. And it makes my life a lot easier. So we have something to do. And now somebody is going to work on that. So somebody is going to come here um, create a, a new branch. So usually you go to your uh, text editor, but uh, I'm going to do that right here. Oh, sorry, I need to create that branch. So let's say this is uh, a new branch. And I'm going to, on that branch, just change quickly um, some text. All right? Let's do that here. And I'm going to say, welcome to Madrid. All right? Let's commit that. Okay, create. Let's create a pull request based on that. Okay. All right, and we're going to be quick. I'm going to do that. All right, I got my pull request over there. Great. And one thing that's very time consuming. Um, I mean, that one thing that's really important, and we, we showed that already, is that we want to go fast to production. We want to be able to deploy quickly things. But then we don't want to push codes without any good quality process. So code review is a very important process. But it's always the question has always been about you know, who is the right person to do my code review, and how can I go faster identifying the right people for the right, uh, for the right piece of code that has been changed. So as you can see here, I got automatically uh, a team that's been selected to do my review because I was able to configure my system to say if it's uh, if it's an HTML page, it needs to be reviewed by this team. If it's a JavaScript stuff, it needs to be reviewed by another team. And you can go quickly that way. You don't have to think again about you know tra traging things. But that's beside the point here. So what we want to do here is that we want to. So we want to have our people, our team, to review that code, but we also want to test that by, you know, looking at it, like run it somewhere. And one cool thing that you can do is to have some robots. So you can have some bots plug, plug into GitHub listening to events. So I created one that can listen to a new label. So that bot will listen to a list, a given list of events, and will trigger deployments based on the name of the, of, the, uh, of the label. So I have a deploy to test label. So I'm going to put that here. 
All right. And if everything goes well, yeah. So that bot, that bot uh, has uh, cooked the event and is now requesting a deployment for me. Right? So I just, I, I don't know how it's deploying. I just know that somewhere, some, something is doing the work for me. And as a developer, it's totally abstracted. So somebody from my ops team created that. I just, I'm just using it. So that branch is being deployed here. And um, if it's, if I'm lucky enough, it should be fast. But let's look at what's going on, because I told you we will have a look at that. So my bot is just triggering the deployment. My bot is not doing anything, uh, really. It's just uh, sending an event saying, we want to deploy this thing because a label was applied. So behind the scene, what I have is a GitHub Actions or a GitHub workflow um, made of actions that is actually doing my deployment. So here you see, I now have that workflow being executed directly on GitHub.com executing several steps that I've uh, requested from that system. So let's, let's have a look at how it works and how it's, been, uh, how it's been deployed. First of all, it's based on a file, which is always cool. I mean, you can, you can always you know, edit that file manually. It's the, we got a nice graphical editor. But if you go to edit mode, you can always go to the uh, to the code itself and, and change things by yourself. So it's based on the HCCorp uh, configuration language, HCL. Um, so it's a subset of that. But let's remain visual for now. So what do we have here? Um, and uh, let's, let me try to work with the resolution here because we're not seeing much. Yeah, there you go. All right. So here, you see on the left side, I got a bunch of workflow, uh, a workflow being, uh, being ready to be executed. So I got one for continuous integration, for instance. This is, a, this is an express application. So I'm doing an NPM install and then an NPM test. So whenever I'm pushing some code, that's what's going to be executed. Um, I'm going, whenever I'm doing test deployment, I'm going to deploy to a given uh, Zeit, so that's a, a platform as a service I'm going to deploy over there. Um, and uh, well, I got some other things like deploy to production, it would be slightly different, different workflow. So if we look at how that works here, let's say I want to create a new step here and just drag that. And on the right side here, I got access to all these actions already made by somebody on GitHub. All, right? all these building blocks are ready to be used. And I can just go and pick up anything that's already existing. So you got a, you got a short list here of very cool actions that are already execute, existing. But if I go all the way to the top, you're seeing also some that are local. So not all the building blocks are existing already on GitHub. And I can just create one by myself in my repository if I need one. Right? And think about it. So if you look at what we've been doing for many years in continuous integration, We've been, uh, we've been having this automated system that can do a lot of things, but the concept of building blocks was not completely there, right? So you had a very limited set of things you could reuse directly to create your systems, and um, there was a lot of copy and pasting, so it was the, the experience was not great. So here you get GitHub as a library of building blocks for your uh, workflows for your deployment process, for your uh, continuous integration process. It's like having NPM, but not for JavaScript. It's NPM for CI, it's NPM for CDs, it's NPM for all these things, and it's going to be right there for you. Um, so if we want to look at one of these, how do we uh, create our own uh, action? So I got this update deploy status one here. Um, you see it's super easy. Then it's sitting here, I got two files just two files, a Docker file. So this one would be very easy. Um, I don't need many things here. So it's just, uh, just a basic uh, Docker files with uh, starting for a, you know, a very uh, simple image. And what I have behind that, oops, sorry. Oh God, I wanted the wrong thing. And uh, an entry point, .sh. 
So I could do that. I could create my own program if I need to do something very complicated. But here, I, I just need to use some couple uh, script stuff. And that's all I need to do my actions, to build my own actions. So a building blocks that is going to be executed right into GitHub, and I'll be able to expose to the rest of the world, share that with my team, share that with the rest of the world, keep that private in my project, doesn't matter. But with that, I can go faster. So that's what we had here. So if I'm going back to my pull request, we're going to see that I've been deployed uh, to a test environment, and I can just click here and view, uh, view my deployment. So very complex application, but it works, right? And I just have a repo to do that. Just have a repo and, and Zite as a platform, but I don't have any other servers to run these things, and I can do much more complicated things if I want. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, let's uh, wrap that thing up because I don't have much more time. Let's put that. I just wanted to put that on project here, and let's say that I forgot to say that I wanted to uh, fix this pull request was here to fix that issue, which was we need a new welcome message. And I'm going to, so you see all the, the different blocks that have been executed here, and potentially I could um, look at the details of all these you know, actions, executions, if I want to see exactly what happened. But let's merge my pull request, and I'm going to do that quickly. Um, I'm going to be bad and not wait for a code review. Let's confirm that merge. And, you know, a lot of time we're spending in development is about also reporting, you know, saying to other people that, yes, I've done that, oh, I forgot to move that ticket, blah, you know, whatever. Um, what we can see here is just by doing my code, everything was moved to the down column, so I don't need to do any reporting. Uh, I think we can, s if we could remove the reporting task from our job, uh, we could save a lot of time. And um, hopefully, I gave it enough time. So let me just check. It just, I just have one minute, so hopefully my process is fast enough. Um, one of the things that I love is also to, um, you know, to have a, a, an up-to-date documentation. So how do you make sure that that thing that's stored in a PowerPoint somewhere or in Confluence somewhere else is actually matching your code? So I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, documentation as code. And while well, we get, you know, we get actions to do that now, we can make sure that whenever we're merging pull requests, our documentation is automatically refreshed, and we can, you know, forget to update things when they don't really need to be updated. Besides, uh, just uh, changing a snippet of code or something like this. So, hopefully, come on, come on, come on. That's the beauty of like you know building a container on the fly and like deploying it somewhere, running it and everything. It's it's not that fast sometimes. Yeah, we're here. So as it has succeeded, we can see the list of environments we have. So that's uh, where we deployed earlier. So deployed to test. And I do have a GitHub pages thing here and should not say Oh my god, it didn't deploy? Oh, just now. There you go. So let's see about the view deployment. In here, I got a brand new documentation that says, Welcome to Madrid. So my code has changed, my documentation has changed. I'm saving some time again doing automated things. All right, and that's it. I mean, hopefully, it gives you, uh, it gives you the, uh, the willingness to apply now to the beta program of uh, the GitHub Actions. I mean, it's free. You can go ahead, you can play with that. Uh, and hopefully you can automate many things and go faster and spend more time coding uh, than you know, doing other stuff. Thank you. <laughs>